No? Yes. Okay, so uh, <coughs> if I'm not mistaken, this is our last lecture. No. <laughs> okay, I'll pretend I didn't hear anything. Okay, so we, uh, we were computing the uh, density of states for the Gaussian um, orthogonal ensemble. Um, in the quenched uh, version, so by averaging the replicated uh, partition function, just to recall, uh, I wanted to quickly finish the uh, calculation. We landed on the um, southern point equation for uh, the conjugate uh, density, which read in uh, n-dimensional um, coordinates, minus i and epsilon over 2, summation over a, u a square, plus i mu hat star of omega. And upstairs, we have the same thing. into the dot product of y and w squared. And then after a series of uh, manipulations in the um, replica symmetric um, limit, we ended up with some um, expression, including angular variables. And we obtained from here that i mu star of y, in terms of the scalar variable, which is basically the radius in n-dimensional coordinates, was given by this expression, where c of lambda satisfied some self-consistency equation. And then it is equal. <laughs> by solving the self-consistency equation, we got uh, C of lambda equal to 1 over 4 i lambda epsilon plus minus root of 2 minus lambda epsilon square. OK, this was just a, a recap. So let us recap what we need to do. So by the Edwards-Jones formula, we need to compute minus 2 over uh, pi n. Then we have a limit epsilon to 0 plus. Then we have the imaginary part of the derivative with respect to lambda. Of here, you would have the average of the logarithm of z. And this average of the logarithm of z, we used the replica trick. So this would be the limit n to 0 of 1 over n log of the average of the replicated partition function. But then we know that the re replicated partition function, average over the disorder, can be written as a functional integral over the density and the conjugate field of exponential n into an action, which depends on the replica index. And this action depends on mu, mu hat, and lambda. Lambda is the point at which we, we want to compute the, the spectrum. Which means that in the large n limit, this will be dominated <coughs> by the configurations that, makes, that make the um, action stationary. And we computed the subtle point equation there, basically. OK, so what we can, uh, we can do is we will we, we now try to plug this expression here inside the Edwards-Jones um, formula here. So you see that we will have a logarithm of the exponential, so we can cancel the two. Then we will have uh, a factor of n 
that cancel out this factor uh, here. And then what, what basically remains is 1 over little n into the action Sn evaluated at this other point. Now, what we can, uh, we can do now is, um, well, okay, we can simplify this then. So it would be minus 2 over pi um, limit epsilon to 0 plus. Then we will have to take the imaginary part and then we can try to exchange the limits and the derivative. So let's take the limit here, 1 over n. And then we take the derivative with respect to lambda of the action as n evaluated at the subtle point. So this, uh, this trick is, uh, is useful. Uh, because now we can, we can take the derivative with respect to lambda of, of our uh, action. So if you remember, now I will uh, write it again, the action consisted of three, um, three bits, okay? But lambda appeared explicitly only in one of them, only in the third, in the third one, the one with the logarithm in, in front. The other two bits depend only on mu and mu hat, so the dependence on lambda is implicit. So when you, when you take the derivative with respect of lambda of the first two bits, you should first differentiate the action with respect to mu and then differentiate mu with respect to lambda using the, the chain rule, basically. And all the derivative of the action with respect to mu and mu at vanish because we are at the critical point. So actually, the derivative with respect to lambda actually acts only directly on the third chunk of the, of the action. And this is a massive simplification. I'll just write it down for you. Can I raise uh, this side? No? You're cracking jokes. Good. Okay. So, the action, I just rewrite it for you. was uh, minus i. Remember that the action is still, was still written in terms of the angular integrals, right? So we made, we made an assumption on the behavior of mu, but the action is still, in principle, a function of everything, you know, radial coordinates and angular coordinates. So we will need to use our polar or spherical decomposition on the action as well. But luckily, we don't have to do it on all our terms, but just on the third of them. So we will have mu uh, of y, uh, mu of w, and then we have, um, let's say, y dot w square. And then we have the third term plus logarithm of the integral r to the n dy exponential of minus i lambda epsilon over 2 summation over a y i square plus i mu hat of y. OK. So the lambda dependence, as I was saying, appears explicitly only here. Okay. Of course, lambda is also hidden inside here because mu and mu hat, once evaluated at the central point, satisfy an equation where lambda appears explicitly. Okay. But the point is that when we differentiate the action with respect to lambda, we, we should differentiate the action with respect to mu times the derivative of mu with respect to lambda. But the derivative of the action with respect to mu at the subtle point is zero, just, be, just by definition. So the derivative with respect of lambda of this object only acts here. So we can perform it explicitly. And we can say that rho in the limit n to infinity, let's say, of lambda will be equal to minus 2 over pi limit epsilon to 0 plus the imaginary part of limit n to 0 
of 1 over n, and then we take the derivative with respect of lambda of this object here, which gives downstairs this object here. And we can now evaluate this integral directly in n-dimensional polar coordinates, just to save one, one step. So you will get integral 0 infinity dy y to the power n minus 1, then exponential of minus i lambda epsilon over 2 y square, because this is the uh, radius square in the, uh, of, of the n-dimensional vector y, um, plus this object evaluated at the saddle point, we know what it is. It is c of lambda y square. Okay? Times we will have here <coughs> some angular uh, integrals, okay? But this, these angular integrals will cancel out between downstairs and upstairs, okay? Note, note that here we don't have any scalar product anymore, so we, we don't have to, to keep one angle in the game. All the angular integrals downstairs and upstairs will cancel. So if we take now the derivative with respect of lambda here, we will get minus i over, sorry, minus i over 2. Minus i over 2. And then the radial integral will be basically the same with a factor. So it will be y to the n minus 1 times y squared, because we are differentiating with respect to lambda. So there is this, this bit that, that comes up. Exponential minus i over 2 lambda epsilon y squared plus c of lambda y squared. So the, the angular integrals are canceled out. The, so the only difference between upstairs and downstairs is this, this here. Because here we would have y to the n minus 1 from the change to spherical coordinates times y squared, which comes when we differentiate this object with respect to, to lambda. OK, so derivative with respect to lambda of minus i lambda epsilon over 2 times the radius, which is y squared. So if we differentiate with respect to lambda, we get this, this object here. OK, so now we see that our formula starts to work. Why? Because we have a minus, minus sign here that cancel out, and we have a factor of 2 that cancel, that cancel out. So we can cancel this guy here, this guy here. And then we have a factor of i in front. So we, we need now to take the imaginary part of i times something. So we can convert this into the real part of something. Okay? So we can simplify this and say that this is equal to 1 over pi limit epsilon to 0 plus of the real part, because we are taking imaginary part and this i out. So we take the real part of this object here. But now you see, these, these two integrals, we can perform them exactly. Right? There, is, there is nothing unknown here. It is an integral of exponential minus a y squared into a power. So the, these integrals are of the gamma, gamma type. So I leave it to you to do this, this uh, exercise to compute the integral upstairs and the integral downstairs. You just simplify. And, and what you get is a simple function. The simple function will be little n times something. So this little n cancel with, with, with this guy, and, and you get a perfect, perfectly defined replica, replica limit. Okay, so all you have to do is to compute this integral, this integral, simplify them, and observe that the leading term for n to 0 is proportional to n. If you do this, this operation, all, all of this and, and the imaginary part, which has been converted to the real part, becomes just a function of c of lambda, c of lambda and lambda, which are the only players in the game. So what you get is 1 over 
minus 2 c of lambda plus i lambda epsilon. So after this long tour de force, all we, all we have to do is to take the definition of c of lambda, which I very wisely erased. So you take the definition of c of lambda that we, we had determined. Lambda epsilon is lambda minus i epsilon. And then you need to extract the real part of this, of this complex number, which is 1 over a complex number. So you need to rationalize upstairs and downstairs and, and, take, and pick the, the real part. OK, so let's see how this works. So C of lambda is 1 over 4 i lambda epsilon plus minus root of 2 minus lambda epsilon square. And lambda epsilon is lambda minus i epsilon. So what we can do is we can write C of lambda in terms of its real part. Let's call P epsilon of lambda and its imaginary part. Okay? So using the, the usual lemma that I gave you many times, that the root of A plus IB can be written in terms of Cartesian um, coordinates, you can find out that P epsilon of lambda is 1 over root 2, root of um, 2 minus lambda square plus epsilon square plus root of 2 minus lambda square plus epsilon square square plus 2 epsilon lambda square. And Q epsilon of lambda is equal to the sine of 2 epsilon lambda divided by root 2 root of 2 minus lambda square plus epsilon square square plus 2 epsilon lambda square, exactly as, as there, minus 2 minus lambda square plus epsilon square. Okay? So now we have two um, real, real objects that make up the real and imaginary part of, of C of lambda. Now all we have to do is to plug this object here, rationalize the denominator, and extract the real, the real part. Now, if you, if you do that, you obtain that the real part of 1 over minus 2 C of lambda plus I lambda epsilon is written as minus 2 P epsilon of lambda divided by 4 P epsilon square of lambda plus lambda minus 2 Q epsilon of lambda all square. Okay, that's, that's just a simple, simple exercise. So what, what remains to be, to be done is the limit epsilon to, to 0 plus. So in the limit, so in the limit epsilon to 0 plus and for minus root 2 smaller than lambda smaller than root 2, we have that P0, so P epsilon to 0 of lambda, converges to plus minus root of 2 minus lambda square over 4. And Q naught of lambda converges to lambda over 4. So if you now plug this object here and this object here, and you do your simplification, picking the right sign and dividing by 1 over pi, what you get is that rho n to infinity of lambda is 1 over pi root of 2 minus lambda square 
for lambda smaller than root 2 and 0 otherwise. So this is basically a, the, the, an exceedingly complicated way to, to get the, um, the semicircle, but I just, I just did, it, did the calculation in full, top to bottom. So just for um, pedagogical reasons. Okay, so the Edwards-Jones formula indeed works in the quenched, so in the correct uh, <coughs> version, provided we use the, the replicate trick and we continue analytically the result for the replicated partition function in the vicinity of uh, n equal to zero. Okay? Now, what, what I wanted to do now is basically redo the same calculation in, in, uh, in a less trivial case, meaning in a case where we don't have another way to, uh, to obtain the spectral density. So the case of sparse sparse random matrices. So the, the structure of the calculation will be uh, identical, but of course the result will be something non-trivial non that we don't have any way to, to check unless we do uh, numerical simulations. Okay? So the... Um, can you erase here? Look, guys. Huh? You're not happy? Look what, what, look what you got. Four hours of my life. It's, it's brilliant, right? We have a full, full course, uh, Calculus 1. Sorry? Yes, excellent. Two points more on Saturday. <laughs> we have a full course of Calculus 1, limits, derivatives, you know, everything. Multiple integrals. And then in the end, everything boils down to this. Simple, simple thing. I think you should be impressed. You're not? Good. Good. Okay. Now let's uh, gear up, buckle up. So what? What we are going to derive today is the so-called Bray-Rogers Bray -Rogers equation for the spectral density. of sparse random matrices. So th this calculation should be uh, relevant for the, uh, for the people who are working in uh, graph theory, complex networks, this type of stuff. So thanks to the Edwards-Jones uh, formula, we can in principle compute the spectral density of the adjacency matrix or the Laplacian matrix of, of a random random network, okay? So the starting point is, uh, is the usual formula. Uh, I don't, for some reasons, I wrote rho of x instead of rho of lambda. So I'll stick with the notation in the notes to avoid confusion. It's the same, the same thing. So you remember that z of x has this multiple integral representation. Exponential minus i over 2 So is it is it uh, clear to everyone why we have we need to have a complex number here with a, with a negative sign in front? 
So wh why we can't, we can't really write this uh, object in terms of a proper Gaussian integral on real variables? Because if if we didn't have if we didn't have a complex variable here, given that the spectrum of H can take positive and negative values, we would we wouldn't be guaranteed that this integral is convergent. Instead, if we put a minus i here, so the real part here, since this object is lambda x minus i epsilon, so you get that i and i gives a minus one times minus is a plus, times minus is a minus. So the real part of this object goes as exponential of minus epsilon y squared. And this guarantees that this integral is convergent. OK? No matter what the spectrum of, of H is. OK? Good. So now we, we do redo the same calculation, but this time we assume that H is not a Gaussian uh, matrix. So Hij has a structure of this form. Cij, the so-called connectivity matrix, times Kij, where the Cij are sampled independently from a distribution of this type. So our matrix is symmetric, and each of the entries of the connectivity matrix is either 1 or 0. with some probability. OK? So, so we, have, we have a connectivity matrix which is filled with 0 and 1s with some probability. If C is very high, you will get a lot of 1s and very few zeros. If C is low, you will get a lot of zeros and um, few 1s. So a matrix of, of this type is, is what? Guys working in complex networks. Yeah, yeah so, so this, this would be an, an adjacency matrix of what type of graph? Sorry? Yeah, but if you, if you really use this probability distribution, what type of graph, what, what's the name of the graph, of the corresponding graph? Yeah, so this, this will be an energy So that's exactly the definition of Nedrich uh, Rainey graph. It's a graph whose adjacency matrix has links or no links between edges exactly drawn from, from this probability. Okay? And on top of that, since it doesn't uh, make the complication, uh, make the calculation harder, we put some weights. So all the entries that are non zero are modulated by some um, value, kij, which is also a random variable. And we assume that, so the, the kij are independent random variable, but the distribution of kij is unspecified at this, um, at this uh, stage. So actually, we can do the whole calculation till the end without specifying the distribution of, uh, of the uh, weights. Only at the very end, if we want to obtain specific results, we can plug in the distribution of, of k. Okay. Good. So we use, again, the uh, replica identity. So all we have to do is to replicate the partition function and take the average, but this time the average is not taken with respect to Gaussian variables, but is taken with respect to the joint distribution of the C's and the and the K's. Okay.
Good. So the replicated partition function, we can write it as follows. So uh, an external average over the distribution of k variables. This means that we are just integrating over dk11, dknn, pk11 times pknn. We don't care. We just take it outside. And then we perform the average over the connectivity matrix first. So this should be And then we are basically replicating the partition function. So this integral runs over r to the capital N times small n. Um, so this one is multiple vector of n component, of capital N component. And we have little n of, of them, minus i over 2 summation. I in J, <coughs> summation over A, and then we have Y I A, Y J A, and here we have X epsilon delta I J minus H I J. So it's, it's this, the same thing we had, we had before, except that before this object was uh, a product of Gaussians for the uh, diagonal and of diagonal elements with, with different variants. In, in this situation, this P C I J has this uh, distribution only on zeros and, and ones. And we can try to perform this, um, this average. So we need to perform the average over the disorder first, remember. So we need to exchange the order of the integration. So what we do is we take this external average over, over k. And then we have the integral over product of the auxiliary degrees of freedom y of what? So this. This diagonal term does not depend on the disorder, so we can pull it out. So we can write exponential of minus i over 2 x epsilon summation over i summation over a of y i a y i a. So it is a y i a squared. times the bits the bit that depends on the on the disorder so it will be product i smaller than j d c i j then we have that p c i j is equal to 1 minus c over n delta c i j 0 plus c over n delta c i j 1 the distribution of the connectivity matrix. And then I need to average with this distribution the term here. Remember that this guy here is called Cij, Kij. So we need to write, well, let's move the average inside because it's the average over k. So exponential of i summation i is smaller than j, summation over a y i a c i j k i j y j a so we have this this big external average over k and now we need to perform the average over the connectivity matrix of this of this object so now the, the things simplify considerably, right? Because C i j can only take value 0 or 1. So if C i j takes value 0, which happens with probability 1 minus C over n, 
So this entire object becomes the exponential of zero, so it just becomes one. So this entire thing crumbles down. If Cij is equal to one, which happens with probability C over n, then we are left with some non-trivial bit, which is the exponential of i summation of yia kij yja. Okay? So we can get rid of the Cij easily. The average is over the connectivity is easy. Let's do it. So the average over the Cij will be equal to what? Well, we will have a product because everything is uh, independent. So we have a product of variables that are independent. So we can, we can do the average one by one. So then we can have the average in here over k. And this average will be given by 1 minus c over n times 1, right? So whenever cij is equal to 0, all this object is, is not there. So it will be 1 minus c over n. And then we have plus c. So this would be basically the situation where cij are 0 plus c over n, and this is the situation where the cij are 1. So we get exponential of i summation. Well, there is the, the summation i smaller than j is taken care of here. So there is only a summation over a. So we get y i a k i j y, j, a. So the, the average over the connectivity is extremely easy. It's almost trivial, just because cij can only take values 0 or, or 1 independently. So, so this multiple integral just becomes the, the product of individual integrals, one for each entry. OK, so we can uh, rewrite this object in a slightly fancier way, which is 1 plus c over n times exponential of blah, 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 minus 1. OK, so 1 plus c over n, exponential minus 1. And then what is uh, normally do with an i uh, towards the, the larger limit is to trade this 1 plus x for an exponential, right? So this guy here will be approximated as exponential. So let me write it down. So product i smaller than j we can put it inside the exponential as the exponential of a sum. And then we can, instead of summing over i smaller than j, we can sum over all i and j with a factor of 2. Okay? So if I do everything together, I get that this object is exponential of c over 2n. So c over n, but I put a factor of 2 because now I'm summing over i and j, all i and j. Then summation over i and j. And then I let you show this object here can be written as average of the exponential of i k summation over a i y i a y j a average over k minus one, where this this average here is no longer an average over the joint set of the of the case, it is just an average over one representative sample. So P of K.
So the step from here to here is uses this object here. And then if you try to, to, to do this, you, you write the average over the full set of Kaj. And you will see that only one of these Kaj will, con will actually contribute to this average. So all the others will, will basically integrate to one. And this is, the, this is the root of the fact that we can keep the, this average over k until the end. We don't, we don't have to do, to do anything now. We can keep this average over the p of k. until the end. OK, so we have this uh, object here, which is an, as, as a strange st structure. It is an exponential of the average of an exponential. But still, it's, it's OK. So this is the, the, the stuff that goes in, in here. Just try to, to fill in the gaps between these two uh, these two steps. If it is unclear, I'm, I will still be here. Good. Now, what remains to do is, the, is this integral. And now we use the same trick that we used last, last time. So we introduce a density of, of replicas, this mu, mu of y. And here, you see that, that this step is crucial. In the Gaussian case, we, we had alternatives. We could use like a Gaussian linearization or, or other tricks. Here, this is, the only, this is basically the only thing we can, we can do, right? Because we don't have a Gaussian structure. The structure here is more complicated. It's an exponential of an exponential. Good. So now we do the same trick as before. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, that's the whole point. So that's, that's why I asked you to fill in the gaps between, between the two. So what happens is that since you have the summation over ij in front, inside you have a situation like uh, average over the whole set of kij of something that depends on one kij. So for example, k23. So when you, when you perform this, this average, you have dk11, dknn, pk11, pknn. But then you have inside here exponential of something that depends on one specific k, because the sum is outside. So for example, you have an, an average over k23. So this means that all, all these integrals are just one, except the one that you, are, that you are averaging over. And since they are all equal, you can just take an average over a single PDF. So, so they are independent? Yeah, the k's are, are taken independently, but from a distribution that is um, arbitrary for the moment. So the cij are independent, the kij are independent from different distributions, and, uh, but, but while we need to specify the distribution of the C, we don't need to specify the distribution of the K. OK, we, we keep it like this for forever. Is, is that clear? OK. So the, um, the integral that we have to do is dya exponential minus i over 2 x epsilon summation over i summation over a y i a square times exponential of c over 2 n summation over i and j of summation, sorry, integral of exponential i k summation over a y i a y j a minus 1.
So to make progress, we again introduce our uh, density of replicas, which will help us representing this object in a, in a cleaner form. So our y is a vector of replicas. We have our usual friend, so the functional representation of the unity, where we introduce the same conjugate field as we did before. Summation over i, product over a, delta y a minus y i a. <coughs> and then we can represent the second bit of this integral, the one that is different from the, the Gaussian case. And we get, in analogy with what we had before, that the replicated density, sorry, the replicated partition function has the, this form. So minus i n integral dy mu of y mu hat of y. So this, this term is always there. It comes from here. Then we get a term that comes from the functional representation of this object. So here we have a 1 over n, and during the functional, um, this fun introducing this functional trick, the n raises upstairs, as it did in the Gaussian case. So the, the result is plus cn over 2, and not c over 2n, um, integral over dy dy prime mu of y, mu of y prime. And then you have here exponential of i k summation over a y a y a prime over k minus 1. So this, this structure is exactly identical to the one we had before for the, for the Gaussian case. The only thing that changes is this kernel here. Okay? You remember that in the, in the Gaussian case, we had just a scalar, scalar product here to the square. Here we have a more complicated function of the scalar, of the scalar product between y and, and y prime. Okay? That's that's the only, the only difference with respect to what we had before. It's, it's, a, it's a strong difference, but you can appreciate that we are basically conducting the calculations in parallel, basically. Then what is missing, there is always a third uh, term that is, that is missing. And the third term is the fact that this, mul this multiple integral has not disappeared clearly. So the integral is still there, but we can perform it. So now we have the integral. Actually, we can save time because we have already done it. Times exponential of i, summation over i, integral dy, product over a, delta of y, a minus y, i, a. Which comes from, so there is uh, this bit and this, this bit that we have included here. 
So here, again, we realize, so this is a vector, remember? Again, we realize that since we have exponential of summation over i, where i runs from 1 to n, this is just n, an n-fold, you know, n-fold copy of a single integral. So we can write the single integral raised to the power n, as we did before. So in, uh, in summary, this object here can be written as integral dy, like a small n, this, this integral is a small n-fold integral, exponential of minus i over 2 x epsilon summation over a y a square plus i mu hat of y all raised to the power n. So this calculation is identical to what we did in the Gaussian, in the Gaussian case. So if it is, un I mean, I'm just, you know, making, keeping it short because we did the exact same calculation uh, before for the Gaussian case. And this object is nice because we can write it as exponential to the n log of whatever, okay? So again, if you, if you think about it, the action will still contain three terms here. It will contain this term here, which is identical to the G, GOE case. This term is different. It has the same form, but it, it is different in the, in the details. And this term is identical. OK? So now, if we understood what, what we did for the GOE case, it is clear what we have to do. Everything now is proportional to n in this uh, exponential, so we just have a different action corresponding to, to the sparse matrix case. In, and the good thing is that the, this average over k is still there. So we don't, we don't have to specify it. Good. So what is the... What is the action? We can write it down in, uh, in a neater form. So in summary, z to the n x is an action, d mu, d mu hat, exponential of n where s n of mu mu hat and x has three terms. So it is c over 2 dy dy prime. So c is the connectivity, remember? Mu y, mu y prime. And then we have this funny average over k minus 1 of exponential i k summation over a y a y prime a minus i dy mu y mu hat of y plus the logarithm of the integral dy exponential of minus i over 2 x epsilon summation over a y a square plus i mu hat of y. So now we can write the saddle point equation. Actually, if you look at your notes for the GOE, you can, you can probably already guess what the uh, final saddle point equation will, will, um, will be. So we will have two saddle point equations as before. We can combine them together as we did before. So I'll just write it down for you, the final equation. So you call I mu hat star of y, let's change uh, notation a bit to make things uh, lighter. So we call it c 
times g to the y, g of y, sorry. We just, uh, yeah, let's say definition. So we take this as a definition of this new function g of y to make the, the notation light. So the final subtle point equation is, as usual, we have our g of y is equal to a ratio of integrals, as we had before. So downstairs, we have dy prime exponential minus i over 2 x epsilon summation over a y a prime square plus g c g of y prime. So th this bit is exactly identical to, to the one we had we had before for the for the GOE. So nothing nothing has changed. So upstairs now you can predict what, what the result will be. It will be the same the same integral as here times before we had like a scalar product to, to the power two. Here we will have something different. The something different is just this object here, right? So we are doing exactly the same the same thing, differentiating. So what we get is dy prime, exactly the same thing, exponential minus i over 2 x at sine y i prime square plus c g y prime. And then we have here a certain function of the dot product between y and y prime. And what is this function? F of z is just the average over k minus 1 of exponential i k z. So you have exponential of i k z average over k minus 1. And this z is the dot product between y and y prime. So this, this is a, uh, an integral equation for g of y in the n-dimensional replica space, which is exactly the analog of the GOE equation, where here we just had y dot y prime to the square. And note that the average over k is still, you know, in principle, it's, it is here. We don't need to know what, what the distribution of k is in order to get to this point. So now we do a five minutes break, and then we move on from here, in choosing a specific distribution for k. Hello. Just shout. Some uh, victims' disappearance. Okay, we will report to the police. Okay, um, just a couple of um, historical uh, notes. So I asked uh, Erica to uh, uh, upload three papers um, on the on today's folder. So uh, this, uh, this paper is a 1988 uh, paper by uh, Rogers and, and Bray. So this is the paper where actually the thing was, the, the, the formula was, uh, was first derived. So in, in essence, this object here, we, 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 we can call it uh, the Rogers-Bray 
equation, even though they, uh, they derived it only for a specific choice of the distribution of k. So we, we will get there exactly at this, at this point. So you can, you can read this, uh, this paper, and uh, it's, a, it's a nice, interesting um, document. Uh, I, I was in uh, primary school and was hating math and while they were producing this beautiful piece of work. Then there is uh, this other paper, more recent, by my dear friend Reimer Kuhn, who did so spe spectral sparse uh, random matrices. So he did basically, he redid the, the calculation by uh, Brian Rogers, and he got exactly to, the, to, to this equation. But then he solved this, this equation using another, another method, which is uh, probably more uh, more efficient, but I was just one. I just wanted to point out that equation 13 of his uh, paper is basically the one that we we derive uh, here. So at this at this point, you have two choices basically. You can either, well, you can first you you will need to specialize what distribution for k you want. Uh, so this is this is uh, as far as you can get without specifying the distribution of k. So if you want to make progresses, you need to specify the distribution of k. But once you have specified the distribution of k, you have two choices. Either you follow uh, Rogers and Bray, or you follow Kuhn. And you will get two different methods to solve this uh, integral equation. I cannot, I cannot do both, so I, I chose to do the, the Rogers and Bray, uh, to follow the, the Rogers and Bray method. Um, the, the two are equivalent, but they lead to completely different uh, expressions and completely different numerical uh, methods. But in the end, you can, you can compare the, the results with numerical simulations and find a good, uh, good agreement. For example, in the paper by uh, Kuhn, he does numerical simulation. Um, you can find them on page um, 14 and 13. So here, OK. The choice of colors is not is not the best, but basically you have a numerical diagonalization of uh, adjacency matrices, so the histogram of eigenvalues, and on top of that, the analytical solution. I mean, the numerical solution of the analytical result, which is the Rogers Bray equation for the specific choice of the bond distribution. Okay, so. This formalism works, so we, 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 can, we, can do a, we can go a bit further on by specifying the distribution of k. And then you can compare. You will, in the end, get some sort of integral equation that you will need to solve numerically. So the numerical solution of the analytical result matches exact diagonalization. OK? This is just to. Um, OK, so we can. <coughs> We can go on from, um, from here. So first of all, you, now you know how to, to proceed, right? So what we, we need to do is we change uh, to n-dimensional polar coordinates, and we assume a replica, uh, replica symmetric solution. So we did exactly the same thing as we did before. So in uh, spherical. n-dimensional coordinates, and assuming replica symmetry, we have that g of y, where y is the radius, will be equal to integral between 0 and infinity dr, r to the power n minus 1. And then you will have exponential of minus i over 2 times one angular integral which survives as before. So this will be sine phi to the n minus 2. And then there is a term that comes from here. 
So this term would be f of y r cos phi. And downstairs, you have the same thing, except this last bit there. So all the angular integrals except one have cancelled out between upstairs and, and downstairs. And here we have this, this function that depends on the average over the distribution of the, of the bonds. So at this, at, at this stage, we cannot uh, proceed any, any further unless we specify what this f uh, is. Okay? So we are, we are somehow stuck because we cannot perform the integrals simply, the angular integrals. Now, if we specialize, I told you that uh, Bray and Rogers chose a very specific distribution for the bonds and then carried out the uh, integration. So the, the distribution that they chose for the uh, Hij, so the full matrix, so Bray and Rogers' original <coughs> choice, was a matrix of this type. So with some probability, the entries are 0. And with symmetric uh, probability, the entries are equal to plus 1 or minus 1. Okay. So this is a sort of a GCC matrix, but which is statistically, you know, uh, on average, it, is, uh, it has a symmetric distribution. So you have 0, plus 1, and, and minus 1. Okay? So if I give you this uh, distribution and the fact that the distribution of connectivity is, uh, is known as before, you should find out that the distribution for the Kij is just equal to one half delta Kij one plus one half delta Kij minus one. Right. So if you if you use the definition that I gave you uh, before, so that Hij is Cij times uh, Kij. This K. Then if you pick the, 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 the case from this distribution, then the definition I gave you is exactly identical to this one. All your entries are, are zeros, and the entries that are non-zero are plus one or minus one with equal probability. So with this choice, we can compute our function f of z. So our function f of z with this choice is minus 1. And then we need to take the average over this distribution, over k. So this will be plus 1 half. And then we should sum over k equal to plus or minus 1 of exponential i k z. So this is minus 1 plus 1 half e to the i z plus e to the minus i z, which is equal to minus 1 plus hyperbolic cosine of z. So now we have a specific form for our, for our f of z, where we have taken this, this average over the distribution of k. Now we plug this expression inside here, and we perform the integrals. Yeah? Shouldn't it be a normal cosine? Since they are complex integrations. Um, 
shouldn't it be a normal cosine? Uh, yes. Um, yes. You're right. Um, I think the, the thing is that um, I think Rogers and Bray um, took the initial, uh, you know, the initial integral with, without the i in front. Um, so I think you're right. Um, but I think I use the correct expression in performing these uh, integrals. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I think I used the, the correct expression to, to do this, uh, these integrals. Um, let me check. So what you have here is g of y is, so this integral we can do, the, um, the integral downstairs we can do easily. We have, we, uh, you have the result from, um, from the GOE calculation. I don't remember, it's a ratio of gamma functions, right? Um, instead, upstairs, we will need to perform the uh, integration of uh, basically here you will have minus one plus cosine of y r cos phi. Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's fine. Yes. So um, so upstairs you use. Uh, Um, so you have an expression of for for this uh, integral in terms of Bessel functions, and an expression an ex expression for for this uh, integral in terms of gamma functions. Okay, so. Um, there is like a long expression here. Um, yeah, so you have like a power here. I mean, the exact expression is, is not particularly appealing. It is just, you know, you're just performing this integral. And what comes out is a certain combination of Bessel function. So i of k um, denotes the kth uh, order modified Bessel function. So you stick this expression in here, you compute this integral, which we had in the, in the notes, and you simplify some terms in, in front. And then what you, what you get is, in the end, This final uh, result, so g of y, is equal to what? Is equal to so the n-dependent terms are gone. So here downstairs, what you do is you do the same trick as before. So an integration by parts. And you do it 
to avoid the singularity of type 1 over r. So you integrate by part here, and you get the derivative of this object here that we call g of r. So g of r is for us the same definition as last time. this object here. And upstairs, you have the same thing, r to the n minus 1, g of r, and then a certain combination of Bessel, uh, Bessel function. So if I'm not uh, mistaken, this should be, well, the result came out right. So. It should be okay. Yeah, minus two over gamma n over 2. So all I, all I did is uh, this integral here, this integral here, just simplify a few constants and take an integration by part in the denominator. Then you know what we have to do? Uh, we have to do the, we have to take the replica limit so the limit n to 0. And uh, in the limit uh, n to 0, uh, something nice uh, happens, because this object has a finite uh, limit. This object disappears, and what remains is just a total derivative. So it is g at infinity minus g of 0. And uh, the good thing is that also this object, this entire object here, has a nice, has a nice limit. It's a complicated limit, but you can, you can get it. So n gamma n of in the limit n to 0 tends to 2. This integral in the limit n to 0 tends to a total derivative. So it is g of infinity minus g of 0. And this should go, if you look at the definition, to minus 1. And then all the rest are n minus 1 into this Bessel beast goes to y Bessel 1 of r y. So it seems that if you collect all the terms in the final uh, result for g of y is this integral equation, which is y integral between 0 and infinity, dr y1 of r y exponential minus i alpha x epsilon r2 plus c g of r, which is basically the equation um, derived by Rogers and, and Bray. So they use a different convention for the normalization of the integrals. But essentially, uh, this is equation 18. Should be equation 18 of um, Bray and, uh, and Rogers. So this is basically an integral equation for this auxiliary function g of x. So this function g of x appears inside the, the integrand and outside. Uh, so you need to solve this uh, equation for each value of x. So at each point on the, on the real uh, axis, you want to compute the density. So the density will be computed using the Edwards-Jones uh, formula 
which requires this function g of g of x. So clearly, um, this integral equation so far doesn't have an exact, an explicit solution. So we don't we we don't know an explicit solution for this um, for this integral equation. Uh, we can only compute it numerically. We can compute numerically this the, the solution of this integral equation, plugging it into the Edward Jones formula and extracting the um, the density. Okay, so the situation is much more complicated. Than, than the Gaussian case, where we, can, we could crack the, the problem uh, completely. Um, if we followed the other route, the one by, uh, by Kuhn, we would still get a final expression that has to, to be evaluated uh, numerically, in, this, in that case with the population dynamics algorithm. So uh, neither of the two routes really gives you a very explicit um, results. So you still need to work to work out numerically what this object uh, is. So actually, uh, not exactly for this uh, for this model characterized by this uh, distribution of k, but a similar model. Um, the the numerical study was uh, undertaken by Brodericks and the the group of Annette uh, Zipelius. Uh, of course, you need to, to know where to look for because the, the paper is called Stress Relaxation of Near Critical Gels. So you would, uh, you would never guess that there is like a numerical solution of the Bray Rogers equation in there. So I uploaded this, uh, this one uh, as well. So you see on page um, like uh, nine, well, you can circulate uh, this, but basically, they, they managed to, here, here there is basically a longer version of the Edward Jones, uh, sorry, of the Bray Rogers uh, equation for a, a specific distribution of K. And here upstairs there is like a numerical simulation, like comparison between exact diagonalization and the numerical computation of the integral, of the integral equation. And they found a perfect, perfect matching. Instead, in the paper by, by Kuhn, you find the comparison between numerical diagon diagonalization and the result of the population dynamics uh, algorithm. But the saddle point equation is the same for, for both. So um, in, in principle, by, I mean, by following this course, you should be able to understand, to read and understand both, both papers and reproduce all the, uh, all the calculations. Okay. Then, uh, then you should sit down and try to, to write a code to, to solve this, this uh, integral equation numerically, which is probably perhaps not the most exciting task, but at least you know, having an equation is better than having none, right? OK, so um, to be honest, um, I'm done with what I, uh, with what I wanted to, to tell you. So I, I, I think that this com completes the um, the picture, you should now be able to, to do all, your all the calculations by, by yourself and complete, complete the, the, the steps and, and be able to appreciate and read all the papers on the, on the subject. So once again, it was my uh, privilege to, to have you here. I'll be still around until, until uh, Saturday. And uh, so if you have any questions or any doubts, please uh, come and... Uh, and talk to me, and um, well, good luck for the exam. <laughs>